Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, pleased to to meet everybody today. Uh, we are um, uh, fortunate to be having a session which is to discuss uh, entrepreneurship um, and how do we retain a global entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and this was very much um, in the wake of the COVID pandemic, how we could sort of um, re-energize entrepreneurialism uh, and innovation around the world. But obviously, since this agenda um, uh, became uh, issued, there's also been uh, the, the, the big issue now in, in the news, which is obviously around war um, and Ukraine. And I imagine we'll, we'll touch on that in terms of our conversation about uh, entrepreneurship and how to how to get the world uh, engaged and, and active and um, and and, and uh, stimulate entrepreneurship uh, again. So perhaps I will introduce myself and then I'll pass to my colleagues who can um, also introduce themselves and then we'll see how this conversation uh, evolves. So my name is Tris Dyson and I am the founder and managing director of Nesta Challenges. And we exist to design and develop challenge prizes to address problems and issues and uh, develop new innovation and technologies um, for a whole range of problems all around the world, from developing new diagnostics to breakthrough uh, technologies for wheelchair users uh, to new applications for fintech, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a huge amount of experience of of working with innovators uh, all around the world from small um, to, to scale up. Um, and we're really excited uh, to think about uh, how we can really stimulate much greater degree of entrepreneurship and innovation among many more people uh, to address many of the world's great problems. Um, but with that, I might hand over to my um, colleague, um, uh, Fatim. Thank you. So I'm Fahim. I am uh, I am a e-commerce veteran. I guess you can call it. I uh, used to work at Amazon, managing one of their largest categories globally. Started an e-commerce agency called Each Opportunity that um, I recently sold to a company called Advantage Solutions, which now I am in charge of the Amazon presence for the company. Um, Advantage Solutions is a leading service provider for top CPG brands and um, and household brands across various commerce channels. So I'm very um, involved with managing the e-commerce presence of, of many of those larger brands. I'm excited to be here to, 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 to chat with my fellow colleagues. Cyprian, uh, why don't you give a quick intro as well, please? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Cyprian Costia. I am based in Romania. Uh, I'm spending half of my time in Bucharest and half of my time in the northwest part of Romania, uh, near the border with Hungary and with a crane. So uh, I will uh, talk a little bit more about what's happening today uh, in this panel because uh, I feel directly the, the bad situation uh, in the neighboring country. And uh, this bad situation is felt not only by uh, simple persons, but also in the businesses. Uh, I am uh, involved in a group of companies. Uh, we have more lines of business uh, in automotive industry, in construction, in uh, financial investments, in consultancy. Uh, I'm usually associated with the company Autonova, which is uh, in, in, in the automotive industry. I'm also a board member in the national credit uh, guarantee fund of romania which is the only uh, guarantee fund from romania uh, to provide guarantees on behalf of the romanian government uh, through the ministry of finance which is the single owner of this uh, public entity we are a financial institution uh, under the supervision of the national bank of romania and uh, I can tell you that uh, the group of business that uh, that uh, I'm involved in at the board uh, of uh, directors level uh, faced a very difficult uh, situation, including uh, the last two years when there was the pandemic. But I'm very happy to 
to tell you that we succeeded to manage and uh, and to have all these strategies which helped us to go through these difficult times with uh, business growth. And uh, we are feeling that our businesses are getting stronger. Uh, we hope that we will continue on this path. And uh, our hope is uh, a little bit put under question because of the war which is happening uh, in the neighboring country in Ukraine. Maybe we should start with how we think the pandemic has affected entrepreneurship. Um, and I, the, the, the thesis is that it slowed it down, particularly as it's been difficult for people to, to meet uh, and for serendipity to happen. I don't know if that's been your experiences and um, what you think of, of, about that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, um, to go first. Um, I am in an industry that's been largely fueled or accelerated by the pandemic, uh, e-commerce, mm. um, particularly in the US, but kind of globally been an area that people have been talking about for a while. But I think the um, pandemic has, has opened, out, opened a lot of people's eyes on how necessary and how convenient it can be. And there's been some categories that have had much more maturation in e-commerce, consumer electronics and household goals, goods. But there's other categories like CPG and food delivery and apparel and some of these other industries that customers may not have been as comfortable with purchasing their deodorant, let's say, um, online. And they were used to going into stores and because of the pandemic, the e-commerce industry went through a major boom. Some of that um, lasted for a good year and a year and a half, but now that stores have started to open back up. Um, in some scenarios, the, the e-commerce brands are feeling um, feeling pressure public kind of currently, as opposed to a year or two ago. So it's an interesting um, time. Uh, I'm also very involved with many of the tech companies uh, and between the, the, the Amazons and the Googles and the Microsofts and the Facebooks of the world um, and, and and been closely following what's going on with the, are we going back in office or not? I used to live in the Bay Area and early on when I left uh, the Bay Area to move to Miami, um, I, I read a stat that nearly a quarter, 25% of people from San Francisco left. That's within the first six months of the pandemic. It's a lot of questions on how much of that is permanent, how many people will come back, is Google and Facebook and Microsoft and Salesforce and those largest um, tech companies, are they going to force employees to come back? Are they going to give them the flexibility to be able to work remotely or have some kind of hybrid model? And then uh, you add on kind of what we call the great resignation, which we've also faced over the last year or two, um, partly for white collar jobs. For the first six months, the year of the pandemic, I think it was a tremendous amount of productivity that transitioned when everybody worked remotely across many different industries. And then people started getting burnt out. They don't, they don't have that buffer that they used to drive into work. They feel like they're working a lot harder. They feel like they're frustrated and they miss out on some of the personal connections that they used to have previously. So we have on one end, the tech companies who want people to come back at the same time, we have employees that are sometimes saying some some portions of the employees say that they want to work remotely for forever. Some of them can't wait to get back in the office, uh, particularly ones that are younger in their career that were hungry for that social connection. So how do these larger companies, it's not only tech, it's across every industry, how do they find that balance? How do they spur the innovation that we're here to talk about? Um, how can the government help with that? And I think those are all great questions that you know, maybe first and foremost, and then I'll, I'll pass it on to Cyprian to see um, kind of your thoughts and, and, and how that may uh, be similar or different, is first and foremost, we have to keep the employee happy. So if we went through this great resignation and the, the number one thing that employees were saying they were leaving for was for peace of mind. It wasn't because of compensation. It's not because of um, additional career opportunities. There's a lot of people in, in white collar jobs that have resigned from their companies over the past year because they felt like um, they weren't happy. So if we want to have innovation, first and foremost, kind of table stakes is how do we make sure that we find that balance and keep employees happy? What Some of that will be related to what their preferences are and how they want to work. 
do we have a hybrid model? Do we have fully remote? Do we have all back in, uh, in office? And then structurally, what else can we do? If some people are now spread across the country and we're used to working in the same city, out of the same office, what about time zones? What about flexible hours? What about pick up for school and virtual schooling and all those kinds of things? So how do you keep the employee happy and engaged and, and, and want to fully commit to what they're doing? I think it's kind of the first and foremost level. And then on top of that, what are some of the structural things? Innovation doesn't happen by accident. I'm sure we'll, we'll all agree. You have to have some structure to it. You need to provide a platform for it. So when we're on Zoom calls the entire day talking about things and we're multitasking on the computer, what, what are some of the avenues? Are they virtual happy hours? Are they, are they occasional meetups? Are they incentives that we need to provide? What are some of the structural things that we can do to get employees, once they're in that right state of mind and they're happy, to, to think about innovation and thinking about doing something that's more than, than clocking in, so to speak, from nine to five. So I would say that's um, largely where, where my, my thought process is, is first, you gotta keep the employee happy. And then second, let's provide a platform, let's provide some structure, incentives, avenues for employees to, to have some of that water cooler talk that they miss. Um, and, and how can the government support it is, I think, uh, their government's honestly going to need to come way after the private sector figures it out. I think each individual company is need to figure out how they how they want to structure what they're doing, and then the government can come in and support that. Is that tax incentives? Is that loosening of restrictions in certain areas where where, where employees um, may feel like um, they've been restricted for a certain time periods, et cetera, et cetera? But I do think it it, it does start with the private sector in, in many of those scenarios. Okay, uh, I will tell you also my opinion and I will try to share to you some experiences that we had here um, at the beginning of, of, of the pandemic uh, from what we were seeing here. It was a big shift in everything because people were used to go to their job, to go to office and these kind of things. And when the pandemic came and there was that uh, huge lockdown uh, everywhere actually in, 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 in the world, uh, people were... Uh, going into a kind of uh, panic uh, status. Uh, and when I uh, am using the term people, I'm referring to business people, I'm referring to employees, I'm referring to entrepreneurs, I'm referring to actually to everybody. The first thing that uh, we were doing was to contact all our partners, of which some are startups, some are big companies, some are small, medium enterprises, some are from... Uh, Asia, some are from uh, uh, America, some are, some are from Europe, uh, some are from Ukraine, and this kind uh, of, of global range of partners. And uh, my experience uh, before the pandemic was that I represented this group of companies and others uh, abroad, and I traveled a lot. I used to go to personal meetings. I think the personal meetings are very important, but because of traveling a lot, I was very used uh, with Zoom calls, with Zoom meetings and these kind of things. For us in such a scenario was not a big problem to make a total switch from personal meetings to online meetings. And these online meetings lasted, I can tell you, all the year 2020. Uh, in 2021, last year, we started slowly to have again personal meetings uh, and we continue on this path uh, in the future. Uh, from um, the innovation point of view, uh, the pandemic brings also some opportunities like all the crises. And I saw a lot of young entrepreneurs which uh, founded all kinds of startups. Uh, they founded, at least from here, from the, the uh, uh, East European Union country, uh, a very, very uh, intense global thinking of the young entrepreneurs which started their businesses even working from home but making their businesses with global connections because of what we are facing today uh, we were used to have no political no economic barriers but now because of this crazy war this uh, normal status will be broken for at least few months even not few years and I'm certain that the young people, especially, especially the young people which want to find companies, will be very innovative in finding out the solutions to develop all kinds of businesses, all kinds of startups. 
So uh, regarding the meetings, the personal meetings, which are very important in developing uh, the businesses, I think that personal meetings will come back, but forever from now on, all the uh, middle-aged and the young generations will be in the same uh, uh, time very used to go online with their partners. And they will feel very comfortable and businesses will be on the ground of safe development, even on such a ground of, uh, of uh, virtual meetings and virtual negotiations and virtual uh, documents, contract signing and this kind of things. Do, do you not worry, though? I mean, I worry a bit that I, I agree there's been a lot of innovation and entrepreneurship through the through the pandemic particularly in, in your case, e-commerce, but I mean, certainly lots of equivalents and we've done a lot, particularly in fintech, and there's been some really exciting developments there. Um, but if you are a, if you are a, a, a you know, a, a startup entrepreneur um, and you're, you're wanting to break the status quo in, in a particular area or sector, I still wonder, question whether it's 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 much harder in a world in which you. I mean, it's called elevator pitch for a reason, right? Um, there's there's getting in a room with a with a potential VC funder uh, or a potential customer, and uh, it's it's the things that happen outside of the presentation as much as as the content of the presentation sometimes uh, that allows you to win that contract secure that relationship because uh, it is a relationship as much as it is about money with a potential um, angel investor or VC funder. And I worry that it's those smaller, new dynamic startups and individuals that are, that are the, where the really great new ideas and, and uh, companies of tomorrow are going to come from that are going to struggle um, in a world in which it is, it, it's just harder to have those person-to-person -person, uh, interactions. Um, but perhaps I'm wrong, and and, and may, may, perhaps we, uh, perhaps perhaps I'm just uh, not grasping the the, the 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 full opportunity that you get through digital communication. I, I, um, I think it's a great question. I think in some cases it can be a blocker, in some cases I think it actually can be an enabler. Um, uh, particularly in the U.S., and, and I'll focus on the tech industry since that's what, where I'm a little bit closer to. It's a lot of migration that has happened. That like we, we've traditionally had the Bay Area, Bay Area. If you wanted to be in tech, you had to be in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So no, no if ands buts around it. Not saying that there wasn't other smaller hubs, but if you really wanted to be in tech, you had to be there. If you really wanted to be in finance, at least within the U.S., you had to be in New York. And mm -hmm. I'm sure it's similar uh, to some degree in London and elsewhere. Um, because of the pandemic, I think so many people have moved and you have new hubs that have started to sta establish the, the Austins, the Denvers, the Miamis, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. across the board. And you have very influential people move across the country. I think if you are not, if you were not traditionally in one of those major hubs, um, it was fairly difficult to crack into it. If you wanted to have a startup um and you were building an app you probably felt like you had to have an office in san francisco where you're paying six thousand dollars rent for something that looks like closet you had to hire people in san francisco that where the entry um level salary is going to be much higher than there are elsewhere and mm -hmm. i think the pandemic and the idea of working remotely um which has largely been um taboo i think in in a lot of the us we've had this white collar culture that you need to be in the office together on a regular basis and i'm sure we still need a portion of that i think the idea of starting a company <clears throat> hiring remotely i fell into the same trap when i was in the bay area i, I only could hire people in the bay area and they're highly qualified but sometimes may not fit the skill set that i was looking for and or pay profile but now because of the pandemic i can hire very qualified if not better qualified people across the country and, and other areas that I would not have had immediate access to. So I would say um, for all the kind of, um, blockers, the cons of it, indefinitely, I think kind of the face-to-face -face element is absolutely important. And no matter what we can do structurally and technologically, we're going to miss a component of it. 
Um, but can we do enough to make it up? And hopefully the answer is that in many industries, the, the going remote, the ability to access somebody because now I don't have to live in the barrier in New York, now I can get across. It does also create a bigger barrier. Now you have way more people reaching out to the top VCs now that they're maybe a little bit scattered across. So um, I think your, your initial threshold to get somebody's attention is probably going to be higher than it was you know, knocking, in, uh, knocking into them at a coffee shop, um, let's say. Um, so I think that that buried entry is probably a little bit higher, but at the same time, I think it could be an enabler, the ability the um, um, and this whole work remote, I guess, environment. So that's a that's a that's a that's a positive and exciting um, take on it. I think I'm 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 partly with you on, on some of that. I, I wonder that um, given what we we were talking, um, Cyprian, about um, uh, the, the the massive flow of. Of migrants coming at, coming out of Ukraine and and how there's a there's a high number of entrepreneurs uh, who are in that mix. Whether whether the, whether there's an opportunity here to to support entrepreneurs that are that are coming out of some of these really challenging environments, given given that remote working or remote entrepreneurship is so much more possible now. Do you think that's and 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 if it's possible, what can we you know, those of us who are interested in stimulating, supporting innovation and entrepreneurship do, do you think, to support that to happen? Uh, yes, it can be a good opportunity for at least European Union. Uh, here, Romania is a part of the East uh, uh, European Union. And uh, we are a kind of transit country for most Ukrainians which are coming. Uh, among the people which are coming now as uh, migrants from Ukraine uh, to, to go out from that bombing and war environment, they, uh, there are normal people, there are employees, but there are a lot of entrepreneurs too. Uh, unfortunately, in uh, this situation, uh, because they have interdiction of going out from Ukraine, most people which are coming are women, with their children in this moment. I still had because we have been involved in helping them with all kinds of things that they need and with housing and with this kind of things, we discussed with them. Those which have uh, businesses, uh, those which have some of them online businesses, are thinking to go in the west part of Europe, uh, not because they do not like Romania, which is exactly near their country, but because they want to be far away from what is happening now in Ukraine. And they just want to go in the west part of Romania. From this point of view, of course, there will be there will be a chance for European countries because no matter what we are saying here, uh, the millions of people which already came and there will be coming in the next uh, at least few weeks or months from Ukraine to European Union, from this uh, huge amount of money uh, of people which uh, will come here. A part of them will remain here in Europe to work or to find to found businesses, to found some startups. And when there will be um, a peaceful environment in their country, they will also develop the business connections with their colleagues, with their friends, uh, with their previous partners. For the European Union, this is a chance not only from this point of view, but also from the workforce point of view, because in Europe, we usually are facing a lack of force work, and this is felt especially in the east part of Europe because from here too, a lot of people went in the west part of, of Europe, in west countries from European Union to work. Uh, but still, the, the difference of the salary level is in the favor of, 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 of the western uh, countries from European Union. On the other side, the governments are involved in... in uh, uh, helping the uh, entrepreneurs, those which are coming from Ukraine and those which are living here. I can tell you now uh, from my position that we are discussing even to, to find out a kind of guarantee program for young entrepreneurs coming from Ukraine during this crisis. Uh, I cannot give you details about this program because now we are setting up the draft of such a program with the basic points. And we will discuss exactly in the next week on Monday on a board meeting at the National Credit Guarantee uh, about such a product which could help on behalf of the uh, government uh, 
entrepre uh, people, entrepreneurs, which are coming here and they want to, to stay here and develop their business. On the other side, globally, globally, there will be between countries a kind of uh, competition to attract as many young entrepreneurs as possible. Because as long as they will come and they will establish themselves in your jurisdiction, they will pay taxes in your jurisdiction and they will bring other businesses together with them. And uh, this means economic development. Uh, I only want now to express uh, all my deepest human feelings to what is happening because uh, staying here at 35 kilometers from Ukraine, I can see with my eyes in each afternoon when we go and we are helping them uh, to, to try to find a temporary solution for staying here or going in, in other parts of Europe. I can tell you that these people must be helped on behalf of the governments and not only on behalf of the national governments and local governments, but also on international level, because there are a lot of wise people coming, educated people, a lot of entrepreneurs which are thinking how they can continue their businesses in the new life that they are facing now. This is a this is a, a really interesting um, line of thought about how we can better um, mobilize to support. Uh, innovators and entrepreneurs um, who are who are coming who are, who are, who are migrating and and coming out from this crisis, as well as a sort of a dynamic uh, labour force, and it, it makes me think in uh, of a small uh, challenge that we ran for the European Social Commission. So this was back in 2016, where there was a huge flow of right, refugees and migrants. Um, into Europe um, and it created a lot of, at that time anyway, friction uh, between the, the, the new refugees and, and, and members of, uh, of the existing community. So, th so this was, this was uh, how do you improve um, that uh, integration of refugees, um, creation of inclusive communities for refugees um, through a through a, through an innovation competition, European Social Innovation Competition, and the call was basically for refugees to develop. This is social innovation. This is not 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 high um, you know, scalable digital innovation. But nonetheless, how do you create um, social innovation companies and businesses that can uh, create employment opportunities and support um, community cohesion within uh, within the um, within the community, so there were examples in in Germany of people setting up educational um, initiatives. People in uh, Turkey that were setting up programs for working with uh, working with young children. Uh, a sort of variety of people were setting up hotels, um, a refugee hotel program in Amsterdam. From memory, there, there were a bunch of of really sustainable long term social innovation. Uh, companies that were set up as a consequence. And I wonder whether you could sort of dial that up and do it on a really major scale where you're, there's a, the proactive reach of funding and support uh, to, to refugees to, to help them create these new businesses in, in a way that's more deliberate. Um, uh, yeah, what do you think of that? Me? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I, I think that the uh, European Union has already a lot of experience uh, because we were facing that years that you were talking about. In this situation, uh, the, the things I think will be better managed, especially because the war is happening exactly near us, uh, uh, exactly at, at the border of the European Union. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can tell you is that uh, including the, uh, this, kind of, uh, this kind of developments, there are already discussions uh, with, uh, for example, universities from Ukraine, so mm -hmm. that their students, which want to come uh, in European Union uh, safe environment, to continue to study here and to be helped to develop all kinds of business development programs and uh, 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 job integration programs, not necessarily to easily find a job, of course, this too, but also to help them to, to think in an entrepreneur spirit so that they can develop businesses 
and they can help themselves uh, uh, with their own force, with their own uh, innovations, with their own business ideas that they could have. And uh, why it's happening this? Because, uh, as I told you, Europe really needs a lot of people, not only the workforce, but a lot of people to come here. We need a lot of uh, uh, the, the economy was developing and will develop in, 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 in the future, too. And we need people for making the economy move better. And of course, the young people. And this is what I gave you this example with the universities, which I know certainly uh, that there are discussing with Ukrainian universities. Those young students which will come here will be helped to continue, of course, to study and to, to help them to develop a kind of business uh, entrepreneurial spirit thinking so that they can settle businesses and uh, just stay here. They are welcome in the uh, European Union. And of course, at government level, at the uh, European Commission level, there are a lot of programs uh, which are discussed here in order to to help the, the the entrepreneurs which want to come here to stay and to feel themselves safe, to feel themselves uh, at home, if we could say something like this, and uh, to develop businesses and business ideas. Uh, you know, one of the things which is happening now in Europe as this a crazy aggression started is that people are not thinking anymore to that uh, uh, scary <laughs> tales and uh, landscapes that the pandemic was bringing in our lives in the last two years. Now people are thinking not to be a total escalation of this war. And uh, they are thinking, especially those which are refugees, how they can stay here, uh, feel safe. And uh, of course, everybody's thinking at least to maintain the living standard that they had at their home before coming here. So, so that's a sort of a, a call for government and for European government to, to act as, a, as, a, as an enabler to, to innovation. I, I don't know, just thinking about the COVID uh, recovery in in the US, uh, where perhaps in the in the US you're a, li a little bit more hesitant, perhaps about government's role in enabling innovation, or whether it's a it, ha it should be playing a more active role, or whether it's a, a hindrance. Um, I don't know where, where where your position is on that for him. Yeah, I think it's a good question, and probably differs by city in the US um, pretty drastically, um, as you probably gathered through the media and the U.S.'s responses to the pandemic over the past couple of years, very polarizing <clears throat> government's involvement, um, government's recommendation versus um, private citizens' rights and responsibilities as part of it. Um, uh, I think, generally speaking, many people feel like the private sector should be more involved and um, leading edge when it comes to things as opposed to the government because it can be slow, it can be polarizing. Um, oftentimes the response that comes to the government is very bipolar because of our two-party system. So almost by design, half of the people will hate no, no matter what you say um, just because of political party lines <clears throat> versus and I think when you know, private citizens and private companies or um, step up and, and have a response there oftentimes is a little bit more well received and it's not that everybody's cynical here i think it's just gonna um the way that um people view the the involvement of the government like mass mandates great example if you, if you followed you know what's going on uh, in california probably as we speak you, you can't go to a number of locations without your mask and schools may still be closing every other week and and etc and I'm living in Florida and it felt like the pandemic never hit. If you look around outside, there's no masks. Everybody's out in the open, the kind of the government supports that and has, has been an advocate for that. It's actually a contentious uh, argument between the government and school districts on should the school districts even be allowed to have a mask mandate for kids? Um, so kind of, I think it differs so much. And that's where I think the problem of doing anything federally in this country is because of how different every state is and their makeup. Um, mm -hmm. they, they, 
even when the government's involved at a kind of more local and regional level, sometimes there's some very um, big confrontations versus on the federal level. So uh, mm. that, not an easy solve by any means, I think, from that perspective. But I, I think the government has to continue to find opportunities to support where they can. And if it's not at the federal level, what can what what can some of the, the local leaders do to supplement what may be missing? I guess uh, probably the way I would look at it. I mean. This is what one of the one of the concerns I think we have in the UK, and I think I would extend this to European level as well. Is this that the, there's quite a bit of, of funding for innovation and R and D um, coming through coming out coming out of coming out of uh, central government, but the government is often not very good at um, identifying where the where where the most opportune places are to put to put the investment and to stimulate growth, and so this. This, this, I think, often then manifests in funding going in the direction of the usual suspects, the kind of the safer bets. Um, so, I mean, you know that, I mean, you, you know, if, if you direct innovation funding towards the, you know, the large technology companies, engineering companies and so on, um, that, you know, to some extent, there's a, there's a history of innovation, R&D development and so on. But I think the the concern there is that, that that's not really a very good use of what are relatively small amounts of money compared to um, the level of investment that, that, that the private sector has to, to, to make in its own R&D um, development. And that what this does is it acts, it can act anyway, as something of a subsidy for the incumbents. Um, and the, what government then really struggles to do is to kind of break free and look at the riskier bets, look at look at the new startups and emerging players that are doing things that are perhaps not very well understood by government and directing funding that way. Um, uh, but I, I, mean, I mean, to some extent we look, or, or in my work, in my line of work, we, we look to the US, particularly on the, on the challenge prize side of things, precisely because this flips that um, approach to funding rather than, uh, you know, taking a bet, putting in a, you know, million dollars or whatever in, in, in X and, Hoping that it will work out, um, where you're then more inclined to to err on the side of caution and put money in where it's gone before. Um, you direct funding towards outcomes, and you say, you know, this is this is open source. Whoever can come up with the solution to X uh, will will win the contract. Will be awarded with a you know in in, in the case of prizes, prize funding. Um, and, and a, a combined with, I think, a more open a, approach to procurement where the public sector is um, taking on a greater degree of, of smaller players on the basis of achieving certain uh, outcomes and outputs. And th this feels like a, a, a model that needs to be grown in order to, to create more dynamism through public sector support and funding. I, I don't know whether either of you have any thoughts on, on that. Um, I would like to make a parallel, uh, a little parallel between uh, U.S. and uh, and Europe. Uh, of course, the private sector is the most important in, in all the normal countries, and uh, the private sector, uh, the private companies are the backbone of each economy. This is very important. Uh, in Europe, uh, there are very deep interests from the governments and from the European Commission to help innovation developed by the private sector. In USA, for example, you had a lot of huge programs uh, which were uh, and are implemented by the, the US government, the, the Build Back Better program, the infrastructure program, huge amount of money. Here in Europe, as a response to the pandemic, we had uh, a program which was uh, named the Recovery and Resilience European Program. Uh, it's about uh, 800 billion euros, and uh, this was divided between European Union member countries. Uh, each European member country has a uh, national recovery and resilience program of which uh, the European uh, Commission provides an amount of money negotiated with each country in part for developments uh, and among the 
important lines which are sustained are the innovative companies. So in, no, in uh, companies which are based in innovation, which are based in all kinds of research and development things will benefit uh, from this program in each country. And those companies which are acting, especially in two basic and fundamental lines, which are the green energy and the digitization process. So the companies acting in these two main fields, which are also active in, in, of, in innovation, in research and development, will have the possibility to access a lot of uh, grants provided by the national government through this European level program. I think it's very good because this is a response to the pandemic. Uh, the private sector is interested in being helped, stimulated through such programs. And finally, all those, all those public money from European level will go into the private sector. And it's very good because this will help all the private sector finally to develop because all the money will, will uh, have a speed will move from one company to another, from one sector to another. And finally, this will help the, the, the real recovery and the building of the resilience of uh, the economies based, I repeat, on the private sector, which is the most important, I think, in each country or should be. But I, but I suppose I'm, I'm arguing that that, that, that money, if it, if it goes to the incumbents, um, which, it, which, it, which often does with with government um, innovation funding, that it, it acts as something of a barrier to others that are more disruptive and are coming in from elsewhere. Um, so so if I, I give you an example, like in, in with, which is, I think, with open banking um, and the proliferation of, of fintech services off the back of open banking. You could have said to the banks, here's the money, develop open banking and develop fintech and all the rest of it. Uh, you know, develop develop more sort of dynamic and, and diverse services uh, that are going to better meet customer customer needs and so on. And uh, they, I think, they probably would have just swallowed that money up and done some bits of. Instead, the approach which was taken or has been taken at least in the UK is open it up and support the ecosystem and, and innovators from all around the world to develop new financial services and products. And of course, the banks then, then buy them when, they, when they've achieved a certain scale. But the disruption is coming from outside. It's not coming from, let's, let's give the money to the, the, existing, um, the existing guys. And, and I think like, that's surely the model if we're going to create a much greater uh, ecosystem of innovation, bring others, bring others in. And, and that's what I think Europe, the UK and US, it needs to get right when it starts chucking this money around, um, in my view, anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, one, uh, one more idea. Uh, my opinion is that um, uh, amounts of money which were actually uh, pushed into the economy are a real positive stimulus for the development of the private sector in all European countries, as well as in the United States, those big, big, big uh, uh, programs uh, which I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, it looks like we are running out of time. I don't know whether for him you have any, you, you want to you wrap up with any <coughs> including thoughts? Uh, um, why, why don't you continue down the, the, the I'm not going to have as much to say on, your, on that specific topic. So is there anything else you just wanted to say related to you know, government and the funding aspects at some point to be as close to that. Or okay. should we just end it uh, kind of in total, kind of going back to the original topic I mean, uh, of innovation and what can government do and what can the private sector do um, in the face of the pandemic, in the face of war, in the face of um, changing habits from, from employees and customers and I think uh, to summarize what I gather from our conversation is that uh, it needs to be a multifaceted approach. It needs to happen from the private sector. It needs to happen from the public sector. Part, part of it may be related to funding and making sure the right um, players get funding. Part of it needs to be from the companies and making sure that the employees are happy. Part of it needs to come from the employees taking responsibility and, and understanding that in this new world, um, we're going to have to make up for some of that face-to-face -face in, in certain scenarios and different um, different consumer um, buying habits now than there, there was a couple of years ago. So we can't rest on our laurels and 
I'm excited uh, to, to have been part of this conversation and share it with you guys. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you.